Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, we cover Kodam, a revolution in computer programming education. No teachers, no tuition, and still a great education. How do they do that? Well, listen in to find out. Joining me today, I have two guests, Victoria Aus, Head of Partnerships and Talent over at Kodam College, and David Giron, Director at Kodam College, and he was part of the founding team over at the 42 Network, where they invented this model. I'll put all their socials in the description below. Check them out, and with that being said, Enjoy the episode. I, I am out of breath. Beyond coding. You will come home often? Uh, once a week. Once a week? Once a week, yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And all the other days you're on, on campus, actually? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Because, you know, we are a small team. We're only 12. Yeah. And we have 400 students, right? So you need to be there. Yeah. You need to make sure that in case if something happens, there is somebody on, uh, on campus to, to jump right in. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But still, 12 people is... Isn't that Amazing, too little? Right? Yeah, I, I, it blows my mind, honestly, how you do that with 12 people. <laughs> yeah, but 400 students, 12 people, like you don't have any teachers on staff. How do you do that? Each of the students is a teacher. Yeah. Right? So they have each other's backs. The peer-to-peer -peer model, that's what it says, that they need to interact with each other and exchange knowledge. There is no ultimate teacher in there. Everybody has a bit of a knowledge that they can share with each other yeah. and help each other out. Exactly. Before we zoom into the peer-to-peer -peer model, can you explain a little bit on how you got in touch with Codem in the first place? Mm, they've been around for two or three years yeah. before I joined them. And uh, at the beginning, they were like a pretty well-known because the, the school was opened by the Queen. Of course, uh, Corinne Figaro, our founder, who's the co-founder of TomTom, Tom, she is a big figure within the tech ecosystem. Yeah. And I've been working in the, the startup and investment scene in the Netherlands since the beginning of my career. So they were already making a, a lot of waves in the, in the ecosystem. So yeah, that's how I joined them. That's really cool. How long ago was that? Three years now. Three years now. Yes. Yeah, that's a good, good <laughs> time actually. What about you, David? Uh, well, uh, I was actually the first employee of Kodam when yeah. it was founded back in 2018. But my story goes a bit uh, more back in time. I'm actually part of the founding team of the, the let's say, parent school of Kodam that's called 42. Maybe you've heard about the 42 network that yeah. is uh, all over the world now. So back in 2013, uh, I was part of the team who created the concept. And back then I was uh, the head of study at that school. So I was in charge of designing the educational model, the content and so on. And well, one thing led to another, and now I'm the director of the beautiful school in Amsterdam. It's just the best thing that happened in my life ever. That's awesome. I, I love hearing that. But walk me through kind of back in 2018, you conceptualized this idea? Are you were involved with that? Uh, yes, definitely. So the, the, the way it works that um, when I was still uh, working 42 in Paris, we were uh, often approached by uh, people from other countries who wanted to export uh, the model into their, um, their country. And one of my roles was to, to help them do that, so to, to explain them how it works, because there's a lot that people uh, see about the school, about the model, but it's actually much more than meets the eyes. Yeah. So to make sure that they really understood that they were uh, setting foot in, uh, also to train their staff and to go on site to, to help them open the, the place, help them with the, the design of the building, of course, but also with uh, training the, the staff, welcoming the first batch of candidates and students, well, making sure that the, the school can start, actually. Yeah, I mean, I've been on campus with, with you, Victoria, and when you explained the model to me, it kind of blew my mind, but I still have, I, I still have a struggle kind of explaining it to other people because it, it, how do you say that? It's a lot, the model, and it's very different from what you would expect. Like, how would you explain what the model is in and of its own in the first place? Uh, sure. So I, I would say that we, we try to do something that is radically different from traditional education. In traditional education, it is uh, teacher-centered. So that means that the students are facing some kind of... Um, passive learning experience. They are sitting in a classroom, listening to teacher, usually in front of a whiteboard or in a classroom. And we wanted to, to get away from that, to try something else where the student would be at the very center of their education experience. Mm. And we have nothing against traditional education, but we wanted to try something else. And that's what we did with this model. So we decided to, to go for a peer-to-peer -peer learning model. So as Victoria explained, the students are learning with each other and from each other. We tried to, to get entirely rid of all the, the teaching approach. That's actually a word that we tried to not to use. We do not teach our students. They learn by themselves altogether. Yeah. And for that, they, they rely on the community of students. 
um, well, to go a bit further in details, they, uh, so they don't have any kind of lectures or anything like that. All the, the learning experience goes through um, solving projects. So we created a, a bunch of projects that are crafted in such a way that the students don't need to have previous knowledge in order to be able to to give a try to that project. So contrary to regular education, where uh, a project's just applying the knowledge that you acquired from, from the lecture or the practical session, here the students have first to understand what is expected from them, because most of the time they have no clue at all, <laughs> and understand or identify the bits of knowledge that they, they don't know yet, that they lack, what, what is it that they need to learn, and that is something that is really relevant at every stage of your career afterwards. And then, acquire that knowledge. So it should be through their peers, through the internet or whatever other means they can find. The point is that eventually they need to get that knowledge and finally they will apply it to the project to solve uh, to solve the problem. If they if they have any questions, what do they do? Because there's no teacher yep. kind well, of to ask. They ask to the person to their left and if yeah. they don't know, they ask the person to their right. And if they don't know, you know, move away, go somewhere else in the room and you start over. <laughs> Yeah, but we shouldn't forget about the online community that we have. So, yeah. okay, so maybe in-house right now at this specific point in time, there is nobody that can help you out. Then we have this Slack group with all the Kodam students first, right? So you can ask over there. If nobody picks it up, we are part of the 42 network, right? This big network of students. I think right now we are at 13,000 wow. around the world. Beautiful. 47. 18. 18,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's even more, yeah. So basically somebody from Korea could know the answer, wow. right? Or Brazil, yeah. you name it. So it's fully it actually, global, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like, um, I believe if you want to be a good software engineer, you need to learn to work in communities. I, I agree. And we put community at the core. Yeah, so. that is really, really cool. I mean, I can imagine the students have a, a very different experience from either previous education or maybe they haven't even had any previous education, like what, what has been the feedback from the students that have gone through Kodam and graduated in that way? Want to take this one? Um, so first of all, we, uh, as mentioned earlier, we are providing a different education yeah. model, right? Because our kids or the youth is different. Yeah. Back in the day, education was like a, like a belt, industrial belt, and we give the same education model, you know, to all of them, and then we expect that some of them are going to perform better than the others or, you know, the same. Cookie cutter. Yeah, 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 yeah. but that's not the way it works. So we wanted to provide, you know, something that is more efficient, works better for different type of people. So if we look at this diversity as its core, just because we give a different educational model, the students that come to Kodam, they this is their way of learning, right? Yeah. They are curious by themselves, intrinsically. So they can, they don't need a teacher to stimulate the, the, the curiosity or the commitment towards coming to school because they don't feel like, you know, somebody's with a stick behind and like, you have to come to school attendance, you know? Yeah. And uh, if you look how they like perform afterwards and what they say is basically that this is like a unique way that gave them a real chance of this rediscovering learning, wow. right? So they, for them, it's it was been the way that they could actually um, stimulate this curiosity and implement it, and then you know, like get the knowledge the way they wanted it, not the way somebody else like imposed on them, right? Exactly. So yeah. I, I like that a lot because also the first time you explained it to me, I feel like it translates a lot than like your educational journey stops, and if you come from a traditional university your work experience is going to be very different because there is no teacher and you have to interact with your peers. Exactly. And there is no focus on that, more so on traditional education. But with Kodam and with kind of a peer-to-peer -peer learning model, I feel like you're already a step ahead because that is that's for sure. Yeah. That is more in line with what happens, yeah, actually. I, I would say that's that's where our education model shines the most. Uh, companies are extremely satisfied with the, the students. Yeah. Well, actually, so much that we cannot provide enough students <laughs> just yeah. lining up. So that that's a rather comfortable uh, position to be in. Uh, but I, I would say it comes from one core idea in our model that is this learning to learn uh, line. I know it's a bit cheesy, say like that, but that's actually what we really do. And I would even go as far as say that the software engineering part is just an excuse for this, for this learning to learn approach. Uh, the languages, the technologies, the frameworks that the student learn, they don't really matter in the end. Yeah. What do matter though is the, the learning process, like facing something they don't know about, 
understand what it is about, understand what they lack as knowledge, acquire the knowledge, like I explained earlier. And this really makes a difference later on when they, they get their first jobs and work for the first companies. Because every day of the day feels like a Monday at school. Like you, when you join a new company, you don't know the people there, you don't know the project you're going to work on, you might not be completely familiar with technology, you're not sure, it's new for you. Yeah. And well, it happens to be like that every week at school. So there is no like big gap between the school and the company, it's pretty similar. Yeah, and very I interesting. One thing that I actually wanted to ask, what in your opinion is the role of education? Providing hard knowledge, providing a full-on skill set for you to deal with external world and professional world? Yeah, I think that's a great question, actually. For me, it's a, it's a combination of factors, right? But where I think the traditional education is lacking, it's always based on a certain grade or a certain goal. Mm -hmm. And there's no emphasis on like finding enjoyment in the learning process itself. Because I feel like if you cannot find joy in whatever you're doing more so on a day-to-day, -day, then you're always going to chase certain accolades. And once you hit those, like even marathon runners or people that um, like do sports on a really high level, when they win a gold medal, all of a sudden they've achieved what they wanted to achieve and they get depressed, right? Because this was, this was the like, highest bar they would go to. And maybe they didn't find as much enjoyment in the process. They just really wanted that accolade. And yeah, they get depressed. I feel like if you take kind of part of the journey and make that more enjoyable, it's yeah, more it's sustainable. It's journey that matters, not the destination. Exactly. That is... Uh, but I don't know what, what education would entail. What, what do you think, David? Uh, the way I see things that, uh, you could see education from two radically opposite angles. One that could be just learning for the sake of learning. Like uh, you can see that a bit like a hobby. You just yeah. want to improve yourself. You, you like learning. And at the other end of the spectrum, I would say that there is the learning approach toward the specific goal. Like for instance, to be uh, industry ready, work for a good company. And I think that if you keep only one of these sides, it's not complete. Mm. You should find a, a good balance between the two so you can improve yourself as a, as a human being, but you can also be useful for the time we are at with the technology we have, with the industry that we have right now, and have a good career. Yeah, exactly. For me, for example, education is formed of like three elements. Mm. The main goal of the education is to create individuals that are prepared to face the real world challenges, right? And yeah. mainly professional ones, right? But also it, like working together and so on. So that's why it's three. Number one, of course, is knowledge, right? We are here to provide knowledge. It's not kumbaya type of, you know, education. Yeah. Number two, it's about skills, soft skills. And number two, and number three is about how to deal with your mental health mm. right but it's again skills specific skills that help you navigate and don't get burned out you feel when you're getting burned out and so on and so forward and then you you, you know how to cope with it yeah and code how does this is basically first of all the knowledge the way the the first one right the knowledge the, the way they get it is they go and search for it yeah it's not like passive but it's active learning it's not right? given to you it's not given yeah. right and you are allowed to go as deep as you want we are. We don't impose per se uh, deadlines for every single project. We pace them. But if you want to take three months, build the most insane video game that you want. Yeah. Who am I to tell you you're not allowed to do that? If your interests lay within the um, gaming industry, right? So in this way, we actually allow the students to go in some of the topics as deep as they want. And in others, you know, they, they're like, okay, yeah, okay, I need to know how to establish a virtual machine. And then I'm going to do it for three weeks and then just go, go over it because it's not something that I'm interested in, right? Exactly. But I need to know that. Yeah. I need to know that because we consider that that's important for you to know as a software engineer. Now, the, the second part with like the peer-to-peer -peer model establishes this connection with your peers, with the team, with the so when you plug the students into your team, they know exactly how to ask questions and how to ask which type of questions, right? Mm. Because first, what they will do, they will try to search the answers on the internet, and only then they will actually come to the manager, right? So they don't expect that the manager would be all like the teacher, the new teacher, yeah. Because the traditional model, you take away the teacher, and the and the student or the kid is getting overwhelmed, right? Um, we should not forget that youth, 
they have a big imposter syndrome. It's not per se that they don't know. They somehow look up to the people and then they feel that whatever they currently know is not enough, yeah. right? But they actually have great knowledge already. So for us, even the third element, remember what I said about the mental health of helping them out to go, o- like get over that imposter syndrome is super important. For example, we say as the education that we need to teach our kids to fail. Mm. But then you, you don't pass your exam once. You're done. You're, no, no, I think you have three chances mm. because then you have to redo the course next year, yeah. which is sad. Kids are not taught to play, right? Yeah. Um, especially programming, right? I mean, you're in front of your terminal and then you just submit code <laughs> and then you see if it's working, you know? So you shouldn't take it like if, if the computer says no, you should not take it personal or anything like that. So the same thing at code, I'm like, every Friday there is an exam. You didn't pass this Friday. Come next Friday. Next wow. Friday. I, we don't care. We don't judge. It's acceptable to fail. It's okay. You learn something. Now you know what you don't know, right? You go back in front of the computer. You learn it. You try it again. Yeah. So having knowledge, soft skills, and skills that could regulate your mental health, like these are the three top priorities for education for me, for us to teach them, right? Yeah, so. beautiful. I like that a lot. I think... Maybe if education was different, maybe even my career path would have been different because I always wanted to go in the gaming industry, but then my choices throughout education didn't allow me to go to that university course, basically. And I tried, and I was years behind, and I failed, and I was like, okay, for me to catch up, I would have to redo a year or redo multiple years, basically, for me to be able to go in the gaming industry. And I didn't like that. I didn't like also going through certain courses where I didn't feel enthusiastic about the content of it, right? Because always when you have education, there's a fundamental knowledge that you need to have. But exactly as you say, I might be passionate about certain aspects and not as passionate about certain aspects. But if they're all equal time-wise, yeah, it's going to be kind of a dreadful experience, right? I want to spend most of my time in the things that I'm really enthusiastic about. And sure, I still need fundamental knowledge because that's just going to help all around, I feel like. But because of those choices, I didn't want to do multiple years throughout that same educational system. So then I just went, a- went ahead with a different kind of choice of circumstances and I ended up here. Now I'm really happy I ended up here, but it could have been completely different. Might the education system have been different as well? Um, 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 if I may ask, yeah? what did you study before university? Before university? I was in high school. You have and like different educational systems in the, in the Dutch high school, yeah. Right? Yeah. Which we, for example, also find a bit weird that the kids are already filtered. Yeah. You know? I've heard that before. Your choice is already limited. Yeah. For some of them, right? That's why we at Kodam, we don't have a prerequisite of a diploma. Yeah. We don't care. What you dropped out from school? Who knows what happened back then? Now you're a different person. You should get a chance to study. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So but the people that know know like in the Dutch educational system and I explained this to my girlfriend, she's from Italy. Like when you're about 11 or 12, you do like a certain set of exams and that already kind of filters you out, basically. Mm -hmm. That's going to say, okay, you can go to this school where they have this level of education and you might go to a different school where they have um, like an easier level of education, basically, more tailored towards what you can do in your capabilities. But those are all based on the exams that you did. So you are kind of filtered in your education and you can move up or down based on your performance but that re- might require a few more years here and there. Yeah, I, I have a, a personal uh, experience like that. So uh, I, I've been born and raised in France. Yeah. And uh, when I was uh, about 17, almost 18 years old, that was the, the time when we were supposed to decide what kind of studies we wanted to do. Long story short, we had this uh, orientation moments with some of our teachers and in particular, that was the math teacher in my, uh, my classroom that was mm-hmm. in charge of that. and. When it was my turn to come to his desk and talk with him about what I wanted to do later, I told him that I wanted to do programming. And I will never forget, the man looked at me dead in the eye and said, Mr. Giron, you will never do programming. Never do something else. Very painful. Yeah, but that's crazy. And if I had listened to that man, I would not have uh, had my master in computer science and I would not be the director of a software engineering school. I mean, how can you say that to a kid? And even if it, that was true, why would you say that? Why are yeah. you trying to crush the dream of that person? That's just, no, it's just mean at some point. There, There is no reason to do that. No, you should yeah. not. I feel like 
like if you really want something you can still do it even though the educational system might be against you like i have a cousin and she always wanted to be a dentist like she's two months younger than me we grew up together my family's pretty close and she always wanted to be a dentist but you have to enroll in a university for dentistry right and it's a, how do you say that it's like a lottery some people get it some people don't based on grades or just based on random chance and year after year she didn't get in Oh, she no. finished her bachelor's in biomedical science year after year. That's a four, three, four year bachelor. She finished the bachelor because she year after year didn't go into dentistry. Now she's Armenian from heritage. And she was like, I can get into a school in Armenia. It's going to take me five years. Now this year, exactly. She's going to have been there for five years. She finished completely her dentistry education abroad. And she's going to come back to Holland. It makes me really, really happy that she's been able to do that. But like the period of her education is way longer than it might have been or should have been in that aspect. That makes me a bit sad. Plus, she's been away for five years. Yeah, that it's was, a waste that was of her time. Hard. That was pretty hard, yeah. But I'm really happy she's going to come back. Yeah. yeah. For the students that onboard in Kodam, I don't know what their mindset is coming into this. I'm assuming they're super enthusiastic. But what is that onboarding like ramp up process for them? Because they also coming from high school or from different educational backgrounds, I think they need to get used to this kind of way of educating. Yeah, we do uh, one month uh, selection. We mm. call it actually a piscine. Yeah. In uh, French, it means swimming pool. So what we do, we just throw them into the water <laughs> <laughs> and then we see which one swims. Yeah. Um, but it, it's sort of the same. Like the, the, the logic behind it is like, you throw them into the deep waters and they need to figure it out by themselves. Don't forget, the majority already went at least through school. Maybe they didn't finish high school, but they went through school. Yeah. The school system says you have a teacher in the front. Here, there is nothing. No. And they are confronted with the model for the first time. So each candidate has to decide for themselves two things. Number one, is programming for me? Because they already start learning uh, C, right? So, yeah. And number two, is the educational model for me. Mm. And then they have four weeks, they have to come to um, to Kodam in person every single day, included weekends too, so it's very intense. Yeah. Um, on average, uh, they spend 10 hours of learning per day wow. for you to understand. Yeah. So I think when they come, they don't know what to expect. They have no idea. But then throughout time, they become best friends. It's like such a community because they have to engage with each other. Right? There's no other way. Yeah. So then for them, even having this 10 hours in, in the building, it feels like, oh, yeah, I'm like hanging out here, you know? Yeah, it's a summer camp. It's a summer camp <laughs> sort of thing. And the beauty is also that we do not segregate, mm. right? So sometimes we have uh, candidates that have some software engineering education, you know, from, from before. Maybe they did the Coursera course, something like that. Yeah. Uh, others never heard about it. Others are like 55 year old with like uh, experience working in teams and so on. And others are 18 that come straight from high school, right? Wow. Because we do not segregate and because we have the peer to peer model, the, um, the connection between them happens and the exchange of knowledge happens. So the guys that did some Coursera course, they will be the first ones to actually help out the, the novice uh, people in, um, in programming to, to, to get some knowledge. But at the same time, the 55-year-old, right, yeah. will actually share, you know, knowledge about, like, how do we divide tasks in the group? Okay, you do this because it's going to work. Every two hours we meet and we, we exchange what we did again, you know. So because we do not segregate, the, 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 this cohesion happens and knowledge happens. Yeah, everyone comes together and kind of leverages their experience. Yeah. And their experience is different. Yeah. And I can imagine that the group that comes together is quite diverse as well. If you don't really have a bar for entry, then everyone just comes and everyone that wants to come can enter. Well, the the rule to join Kudam is actually to be 18 of age. That's the only rule. That's the only rule, yeah, right? The only rule. It's free, no background, no, no diploma whatsoever. You just come as you are. Yeah. And then after that, four weeks would be sounds quite intensive, I must say. People have decided, okay, this educational is for me and this is what I want to do, right? I want to be a software engineer or something in the tech-related field in that way. What is the educational system then? You already said it's like a peer-to-peer -peer review model. The people have to be on campus. Let, let's start with that. 
Uh, you mean during the selection time? No, after. After those four after. intensive weeks. Okay, so you, you, your question is about how does it work on the campus afterwards? During yeah. the, okay, so basically the, the, the curriculum itself is uh, divided into several levels, let's say, of progress. And uh, each level uh, features a set of projects. And obviously the more you progress, the more difficult it's going to be. Mm. And that's about all the structure there varies really there are no timetables or anything like that you can the school is open 24 7 so you come when you want and you start to work on a project that uh, that you like that is at your level right now uh, obviously you will uh, work uh, with other people uh, they will help you you will help them uh, if it's a group project you will join your team and work all together uh, until the moment you're pretty much done with it and you decide to, to submit your work and then we engage what's called the peer evaluation system. Mm. So that's something that is loosely inspired from uh, academic peer reviewing. Uh, the idea is that uh, when a scientist wants to publish a paper or an article, uh, it is reviewed by their peer and there are several iterations until, uh, until the content is uh, good enough. So here the idea is pretty similar, like uh, when a project is, uh, is complete, then it goes through several rounds of evaluation with, a random, uh, with some random people, so it can be between three and five depending on the scale of the project, mm. and then the project is evaluated according to a grading sheet that the staff provides, but it is students evaluating other students. Yeah. And uh, thanks to the, the randomness of it, we can ensure that uh, it's not like your worst enemy or your best friend was going to evaluate <laughs> you. We can detect the anomalies over there. And in the end, we, we calculate the grade. And if it's high enough, the project is validated and the student or the team can move on. If it's uh, too low, then the project is failed. And uh, in that case, I think uh, that's one of the, the most interesting aspects of CODAM. The only consequence is that the students or the team can start over and that's all that happens. No shame, no nothing like that. Just, okay, you are not ready yet, so give it another try and come back when you're ready. And so the, the impact of that is that obviously all the students are not progressing at the same pace, but thanks to that, all the students are not progressing at the same pace. Exactly. They can take their time. If you're a slower learner, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's not a race. If someone needs a week or a month to complete a project, I don't really care. What I do care about, though, is that in the end, they all acquire the knowledge. Yeah, I like that a lot, that not everything happens at the same pace, because that's also something I've experienced throughout my educational journey. It would be like, okay, you would be done, you would have to play around and wait for the other people to also be done before you can go and the next thing would be explained to you. For sure, and there are also the, the problem of if you have a string of, or sequence of projects, if you fail the first one, it makes no sense to try to do the second one. You didn't manage to do the first one. I mean, come on, take the time to learn the basics and then you can move on. Yeah. So all, all the modules, they need to be completed for them to move on to like a subsequent one? Yeah, that's Or exactly. should I imagine like a linear path or is it more like a graph? No, it's, it's like a graph. Like a graph, It's right. like a graph, right. It's, it's even a bit more complex. Like I said, you have several uh, levels of projects, so they are laid out as a concentric circles. You, you start at the first project at the very center, then when once you beat it, you can move it to the next circle that features three projects. Ah. You can beat the projects in the order you like, but you need to beat all of the projects in order to move on to the next layer and so on and so on until you reach the outer circle. And then that's the final project of the, the curriculum that is the internship. And then I think I'm going to give the stage to Victoria to tell you about that part. Yeah, yeah it's basically a professional experience. Yeah. Remember again about the um, imposter syndrome? These guys are like... Every time when they come to me, when they get to that uh, last project, you know, they come to me and they're like, oh, I don't even know what, I, what, what am I good at? I don't know, like, what, what, what kind of, you know, uh, job do, do I want or do I like and so on. Yeah. So we are using this professional experience to give them a safe way to test what they like and what they are good at. So I always tell them, like, create three sets uh, three assumptions, basically. Mm. Number one, what kind of company do you believe you will like? Yeah. Because some of them come and they believe that they know, but I'm like, wait, you never worked in a startup. <laughs> I, 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 you got to know that you know it's a good fit for you. Yeah. So I say, okay, what kind of companies? Maybe governmental organization, maybe corporate, maybe scale up, you know, and so on and so forward. And then the second assumption is, what kind of industry? Like, choose something that is aligned with your passions. And of course, every student says, no, but I don't know what I like. Mm. And then I'm like, okay, if you read TechCrunch, right? 
what are those articles that you know pop into your mind and you actually read the entire article exactly. right is it something related to fintech is it about crypto is it about you know like ai so then you choose make the assumptions that you will like this right and then the third of course because we um we provide only c and c++ knowledge yeah. so for them to, it's a bit difficult to choose like am i a back ender front ender maybe i want to do app um, development so i always encourage them to choose one or two mm. they usually go for the back end or full stack very few of them like front end don't ask me <laughs> for why <some> reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah exactly and then um And then based on these three assumptions, I tell them to search something. Okay. At first, when we implemented, when we started in 2018, um, we called it internship. Okay. Okay, because also the companies, when they looked at us, we were like so uh, alien to them, right? And when the students would go and say like, okay, I'm looking for an internship, blah, blah, blah. Then they would look saying like, what is this kumbaya type of education, yeah, right? Like you don't it. have teachers and so on. So for us, actually, at first it was very difficult to find the first batches of um, companies that would take the, the, the interns. Yeah, I can imagine. Time passed. We are, what is it? Almost five years now, right? The word is out. Mm. The companies that worked with Kodam students, they just, they're just waiting for the next one. Yeah. You know, they're just waiting for, for the inbound. And since September last year, I noticed that the majority actually get permanent contracts or one-year contracts rather than internships. Mm. So this is actually a great indicator that actually they are ready for a junior position. Yeah. They just do not believe in themselves that they do. And they believe that if it's the title of internship, it's a fail-safe uh, environment. Even though most of the companies, if you hire a junior, it's a fail-safe because you don't, yeah. you know, like he's a junior. So you, you need to, to put a bit of uh, more effort in learning and, and development of that yeah. person. I, w- I would like to add a, a little something there because it, it it works also the other way around for us. We we need a way to make sure that our model actually does work out there because it, it would be fair to question what we're doing. Like, okay, it works within our building with our students, with our staff, with our content, with our educational model in our time frame, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. does it still work out there? And that's a very fair question. Maybe we're just living in a bubble and if you go outside into a real company, none of this will hold. So through these uh, internships, we, we also allow, that, that also allows us to test our model. Do our students perform when they are in these companies? Yeah. And let me tell you that yes, they do. The, the feedback from the company, the evaluation from the companies are like through the roof. So for us, it's also a way to, to, to make sure that what we do is actually what is wanted out there, that it actually does work. And hell yeah, it does. Yeah, I like that a lot. And also props to those companies for offering like either a full-time or a one-year contract because that meets them more halfway, right? That already shows that, okay, we want you and we're willing to distinguish ourselves from other organizations by offering this to you already because we see the value add. Yeah, and you know, we live in different times. Yeah. Five years in tech scene, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. We, we have to agree upon that, right? Yeah. So five years ago, everybody was hiring based on diplomas. Mm-hmm. And we, no, we do provide a certificate, yeah. okay? But we are not an accredited organization. So for them, for, for the companies to hire these students, they didn't want to. Exactly. Because they didn't have a diploma. Yeah. Now, five years passed with a uh, pandemic in between, right? When everybody started realizing how important, you know, software engineers are and how difficult it is to actually find some. They started, uh, they shifted the, the, the recruitment process towards skill-based yeah. hiring, right? Fantastic. And imagine if the student is actually used to have only projects, no books, no nothing, just give give the student an, an exercise yep. and see what's what's his or her you know level of knowledge, and that's why you know right now with Codem students for them it's very easy with these technical interviews because this is just another Monday at Codem. <laughs> <and> so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like that a lot. But you mentioned it's not an accredited university. That also means like no one in the Dutch education system. If you go to university, you get study financing. It's basically a, a lump sum of money to help you throughout your education. Right? It it can help you either just finance all the books and all the material you need um, or like travel you even get a travel pass which basically allows yeah. you free travel public transport you don't get any of that no no that's actually the pain point of uh, of students currently yeah 
and we are working since day one to actually, you know, like mediate this with the Ministry of Education and so on. But it's difficult. Okay? I can imagine. So in order to get accredited, you need to have teachers. Hmm. You don't have teachers. Well, how are you going to, to, to get the accreditation? That is so weird. Yeah. At the same time, if you get accredited, then the government imposes different criteria on you. Standards. Standards, yeah. right? And here we go. Then you lose the model, mm. right? But because we still want to provide a different way to educate youth. And yeah. we need to, to maintain our flexibility, our agility. We, we try to not take things for granted. If there is something in our approach that doesn't work, we just change it. We yeah. don't want to stay like that because we need several levels of validation because before we, need to, before we can change anything. So with this set of constraints, that would kind of kill what we're trying to do. If something doesn't work, we change, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I think that makes you more flexible than of like course. the traditional of education. Course. And it's also, that's as a software engineer, that's what I see in practice as well. Of course. Right? You don't like bang up against the wall. If there's a wall, you move, you move out of the way. That's, that's what you do. Yeah. We pivot. Um, but we do work on lobbying. Uh, a lot. David, do you want to talk about the, the the French model that we are trying to advocate for? Oh yes, uh, sure. So, it, it, well, it's a bit uh, different. So, in France, uh, there is like let's say this organization uh, that has been founded to to help education that are a bit uh, out of the box. Uh, yeah that are a bit different. And obviously the, the School 42 in France is the flagship of that model. So it kind of uh, mimic all of the advantage that a regular education would have, but without being within the, uh, the Ministry of Education. So it's called Grande École du Numérique. And through that system, the, the students can still uh, have the, st the status of student, get grants or uh, expensing the travel cards or things like that. Yeah. And that is indeed something that we are trying to lobby to, to bring to the Netherlands. I like that a lot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because but what we like to say is like, we don't we don't need the money from the Ministry of Education, right? Yeah. Because you get the funding, the public funding. We care about our students. Yes. Yeah. They put equal amount of effort, you know, in their studies as traditional education. And they need to get, you know, those benefits. Yeah. Because for them, it's really tough. You might say, hey, but Kodom is for free. Fantastic. Yeah. But the amount of expensive uh, expenses that they have, right? I mean... How? How do they live, right? So they have to work, even though we say that this is a full-time education. Yeah. So for them, it's not easy. No, the um, cards are stacked against them. Yeah. And also if they have the mindset of, because I was like that, I wanted, at the end of the day, I wanted the paper. Basically, I did my education. I wanted to be graduated so I can actually get a job and say, listen, I graduated. That was it, basically. Mm -hmm. It was part of it. I still enjoy, enjoyed the educational process. Otherwise, I wouldn't have graduated. But I really wanted that paper just by notion of, okay, if I have a paper, then getting a job is going to be easier, right? And you don't get an official recognition. At least that's kind of the mindset. And I'm glad it's changing and it has changed, but that still might be a barrier of entry for people. Definitely. Yeah. And we try to, to help them too. So besides the fact that we are uh, a nonprofit and, you know, like uh, we don't have any tuition fees, yeah. we actually have set up a separate fund where we allocate sort of scholarships, yeah. right? And it can be of whatever the, the student needs. It can be an OVG card. It could be, you know, like a 400 euro allowance or a bit bigger allowance, you know, per month. Yeah. And uh, initially it was established again by, by Corina Figueroa, like the, the founder of Codam. And recently we started noticing that there are corporates or like bigger companies that come to us and are willing to put money in there and give, you know, a set of scholarships yeah. to, to specific target groups. And that's okay, right? So we are happy to see that there is also a transition of understanding from the companies that it's time to, to support, you know, some of the students. Yeah, and give to, back. Yeah, give back. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. So, hey, if you're listening out there and you feel like you could be helping us, uh, please get in touch. We would love that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because one of the things that for me, was still like hard to grasp. Is how how is the education free in the first place? It's a non-profit; doesn't make money. Yeah, so there's no no income. It's uh, it's completely a charity. It is yeah. uh, privately founded by the the Stirting Codam, uh, that is itself founded by uh, Madame Corinne Vigreux, uh, who we mentioned earlier, and that's it. The, we are just uh, living on the on the on the foundation. Yeah, simple as that. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. I think it's an amazing way of giving back. It to is. The community it is a very education. beautiful project. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
then when it comes to the educational system, how long is it? And is there some kind of thing like a master's or like a specialization afterwards as well? So it is uh, in in two parts. So first we have this uh, curriculum that we call uh, Codam Core that yeah. lasts for up to two years. It is the the fundamentals of programming. Here the students will uh, mostly learn about C programming and slowly uh, move towards C plus plus. But as I mentioned, the languages are not really what matters. It's all that varies around. Yeah. Uh, long story short, when they uh, finish this curriculum, they uh, they have to to pass the internship. Um, uh, that lasts for six months, and uh, upon uh, validation, then they graduate from the Kodam Core curriculum, and they're facing a choice. Uh, they can uh, choose to move on with their career and uh, stop there, which is perfectly fine, or they can decide to come back for more. And we have the second curriculum that we call Kodam Advanced, that is an expertise track that uh, lasts for about two years as well and that will really focus on more state-of-the-art topics, so it's much more advanced. And in this regard, you can kind of compare the Kodam Core to a bachelor and advance to a master, even though it doesn't map 1-1, one, one, obviously, but that gives you a ballpark idea of the level. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And then the first batch of people, if I might call them that, were either in 2018 or 2019 graduated and now have been kind of in the workforce for four years. Do you keep in touch as well as kind of an alumni? Of course. Group? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we do like a homecoming every year. Okay. In uh, March, and uh, we always invite them for the graduation yeah. because they have to welcome the new alumni. <laughs> I like that a lot. That is uh, that's how you form a community. Yeah, we well. we have some of the alumni who also come back more on ad hoc occasions uh, just to just to 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 be back in the in the school and to to give a hand when necessary. For instance, I'm thinking about Rob, who's uh, back for the selection round. This guy has been out of the school for a few years now, but he decided to come back and help us uh, welcome the newcomers, like to train the the candidates. And I find it amazing that he's taking the time to do so. So one thing that I like the most is when when they become managers. <laughs> okay, so then they become <laughs> managers, and then they come to me and like Victoria, I'm a manager. I made it. <laughs> I need I need interns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, look at you, you know. <laughs> look at you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. So we we actually see this as well, that actually the alumni prefer to hire from Godam. Yeah. We have this uh, event series, it's called, called Talent Day, which happens on a quarterly basis. It's like a speed dating with companies. Always, you know, we have three or four companies that are from alumni. Mm. So they keep on coming back. Yeah. I'm not really sure why, right? It could be also this community feeling or the fact that they are so used to work with Kodam people, students, or this mentality, that they still want to bring those type of people in their team. Yeah. Because for them, maybe it's easier to, you know, like, to co collaborate with a Kodam student rather than with somebody that is a bit more, like, stiff, or you never know, right? Yeah. So... And also, you know what quality you're buying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah. But when, when it comes to organizations, and let's say they want interns or junior engineers even, do they come to Codum and ask for them? Or do you work with any organization? Like, is there a, a certain set of organizations you don't work with? Um, not working with? Not really. Mm. No, I don't think, I think there is one company that I blacklisted just because, you know, a couple of students had bad experiences with them, but I'm not gonna say names. Yeah. Uh, but overall, we are very open to collaboration and we don't really uh, differentiate much. Yeah. One thing that I love about my job is that it's not like sales. Right? There is no business model, right? So um, one thing that I'm not allowed to is to push mm. students into companies. I cannot do um, a deal with uh, Microsoft that every year we're going to send 20 students to Microsoft. Yeah. Why? Is because we democratize education. We give a choice to the youth, right? It's not about the money that are incoming into the school. It's about giving the choice to that individual to choose whatever they wish to. Because if I have to give 10 or 20 students to a specific company, I can easily um, manipulate, you know, my pitch in a such a way that, you know, I will push a bit, you know, the students into specific companies. Yeah. But I don't want to do that. No. It's I very important. It's super important. Yeah, uh, it, it's part of the DNA of the of the school and actually of the, the 42 network is that the students are not a product. So. I know there's a saying like when it's free, it's because you are the product, but in our case, that's not true at all. We, we don't sell students anything like that. We train them and then they can choose wherever they want to go. It's just up to us to make sure that they have uh, interesting offers and diverse enough offers so they can find something they like. 
And, and that's actually a good position to be in because the students can be picky a bit. Like, yeah. okay, I want this company <laughs> or that company. You know, it's, it's, it's great. I was going to say that that is fascinating, right? If there is no business model, normally when there is a business model and things are tight, like if everything is good, then everything is good. But when things are tight, people do weird things. And you'll notice and, and you get, might get pushed or someone might communicate in a weird way. It's because they're incentivized or they have a personal agenda. Like all that nasty stuff comes out of there. But if you take that out, then all of a sudden there's freedom of choice. People can actually just go where they want to go, where they would like to go, where the curiosity kind of drives them towards and make that choice, right? No one is there to be like, no, you can't do that. You can do whatever you want. And I think that's the best position. Fortunately, that's the best position to be in. It's amazing. Yeah. We have a, a wall in the office with the thank you cards from the students. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> I think it speaks volumes. Yeah, I can imagine. That is amazing. And I like that you touched on it earlier as well, David, that the educational model might not be, um, might not only work specifically for software engineers, right? Oh yes, that that's a good point. That's actually something I'm interested in too on a personal level is what if we could apply this approach to the different topics, I, I don't know, and, and the broadest the better. So we could imagine, I don't know, a journalist school or, or entrepreneurship. chemistry. Entrepreneurship. Yeah. Entrepreneurship or dancing, whatever. Like you, you have to be crazy, to go crazy, to really think something interesting. And with time, I realized that there is one challenge that needs to be solved uh, in order to be able to apply this approach to any kind of, uh, of topic is that by design, the students are going to fail a lot and retry a lot, okay? That's part of the way it works uh, with us. And uh, um, it, a good thing about uh, writing a program is that uh, restart, uh, retrying to write a program doesn't really cost any money. You do not consume anything. Mm. But you could imagine that in a, in a, in a profession or a topic that, that consumes some material, it would be different. For instance, Im imagine that we are uh, a woodworking school and one of the projects is to build a chair. Yeah. And then uh, the students are building their chair and the chair is failed. So now we, we used up some wood and we have to find what are we going to to do with the with the broken chair are yeah. we going to dispose of it can we reuse the wood and so on so this would be the challenge for this kind of education if there is some con consuming uh, consumables that are involved that that's a challenge yeah i can imagine and if people pick up bad, bad habits like it's harder for them to get it out of there right if you're doing more stuff with your body if we're talking about dancing then for that's example, harder yeah. as well yeah i like that software allows us for kind of that simplicity right for Cause, sure because it kind of it kind of corners out those edge cases for you. It's more, how do you say that, more sandboxy. You can kind of manipulate what happens and it's easier to retry and restart. It was the ideal context to, to exactly. give it, uh, a go to that kind of education. But, but, but still, I'm hopeful for the future to see what uh, other teams might come up with. Maybe adapt the model. I, I don't believe that is the definitive answer. Otherwise, that would be boring. We would have solved the problem and hopefully we did not. Yeah. So that means that there are still things out there to, to, to be found and to be tried. And if we can inspire some people, that would be great. Maybe even we can inspire the traditional education to progress a bit. Maybe the, the Ministry of Education will draw inspiration from, uh, from us if you're listening you can get in touch huh? we Absolutely. will be happy to welcome you yeah. and have a chat but, but joke aside I, I really hope that we can bring something new to the table to be an alternative to inspire other teams and see what they come up with themselves yeah do you think because the, the barrier of entry is still 18 years old do you think you can lower that as well would it work in younger so yes for sure for sure so in our case we want to have uh, only uh, people 18 or above for, for just legal reasons yeah but obviously especially in programming that that can be adapted to to much younger people and there are other uh, other groups who, who try to do that for instance there is uh, one, one team that we are really uh, close to and they are good friends of us it's called tumo mm. Uh, they, they originate from Armenia and you now they spread uh, through, uh, all around the world and now they have uh, centers everywhere and we, we are helping uh, them to, to come to Amsterdam uh, in the next year and it's, it's very close to what we do actually but for younger students I think it's from 12 to, to 18 or to something 18, like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. So yeah, wonderful synergy with them. Yeah, but beautiful. We, we truly need such thing in Netherlands because one of the toughest uh, challenges that we have is to attract more females in the school, mm. right? So right now we are having, what is it? 30%. Yes, and um, in order for us to get to 
you really need to go early on and convince them that, you know, like this is software engineering is an option for you, yeah. right? Because normally girls are brought up with like the idea that they need to study languages or, you know, artsy stuff. Yeah. And if we would have actually a school that would show to them, you know, uh, how technology can, you know, like help you or like... Uh, um, increase your skills, even creative skills, right? Uh, would be super helpful for us as, as Kodam, yeah. first of all. And Tumo, what they do is they have, uh, I think, 16 programs mm -hmm. and they, all of them are the convergence of arts things and tech, right? Yeah. So for example, you learn how to become a DJ or you learn to make animations. We've seen, we visited the school in, uh, in Yerevan They created a full anime. Yeah. Kids, 14 years that. old. Yeah. Insane. Or like they created this cartoon with like, you know, clay figurines and then you take photos of like. Oh, pop, pop, those pop. are really and hard. It's so hard, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. They just did it. That's and they, they learned these sort of things. And it's not a school. P please note, it's not something that it replaces school. Yeah. It's after school. Okay. After school, two hours after school, you go there and you play around. And it's also peer to peer based. Yeah. It's peer-to-peer -peer based, which is also beautiful. I think I would have loved that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I mean, the podcast is an artifact of it. I've always been innately curious. And just by curiosity, by these conversations, it, it gives me fulfillment. I don't know where it comes from, but it has always been like that. Even as a kid, I wanted to understand why are things like they are? Why would I have a no instead of a yes? I would always want to understand. And some adults did not like that, but I was always the same. And I feel like throughout... Your childhood, you might have that, and some people might lose that, right? Throughout their educational Definitely. system, throughout their adulthood, throughout the workforce, basically. But I feel like programs that like that, that stimulate creativity, you can do whatever you want as long as you do it, basically, right? Let curiosity drive you and see how far you come. I think that's beautiful. Also, recently, uh, there is this trend of going into dream-based education, mm. right? Like we're always so as kids put in a box that you can do this, but you cannot do the other thing, right? Yeah. Or you're very influenced by whatever you see at the, at home, right? If your mom is a doctor and your dad is a lawyer, that's everything you know, right? Yeah. And this sort of programs actually, you you see like an anime, right? And then you say, oh, I want to create this an anime, you know, myself. Yeah. It gives you an opportunity to do so. Why you know? not? Yeah, why not? Yeah. And then they, they, you can become a videographer, you can be a DJ, you name it, you know, so beautiful, yeah. so impactful. I love that. I love that. I've really enjoyed this conversation, I must say. I, I've loved learning about Kodam. I mean, even before this conversation, I really got really enthusiastic about it. So I'm glad uh, we got to do this, actually. I'm really fortunate. Is there anything you still want to share that we kind of left off um, Before we round off. Yes, there is uh, one topic that I would like to touch as well. It is the, the future of education. Mm. Um, because I, I like to, to believe that we are kind of uh, pioneering, pioneering, pioneer, oh, I can't speak pioneering. English. Pioneering. Yeah, pioneering, thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, the, 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 um, like the next level of education, what we apply uh, effectively at Kodam uh, has been in the, uh, has been in the field for a while. People talk a bit about... Uh, It for a long time, but the thing is that it's difficult to apply, especially when you take traditional education. The momentum is huge, so it's really difficult. So we are in a, in, in a very blessed place for that. But the question is then, what next? What mm. comes next? And you've probably uh, been quite uh, aware of the latest uh, advent of uh, ChatGPT and the like, and these uh, large language models are kind of a big deal now for education yeah. and also for software engineering as a whole. So in our situation, it opens a lot of questions questions and I find it quite exciting. Uh, I, I've been doing a few conferences lately or, or, or talks with uh, other educators and I realized that I, I, people don't really understand what's coming. Like there yeah. is a revolution, a big paradigm shift that is coming ahead of us. And the question is not, do you like it or do you not like it or whatever? It's just coming. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, how are you going to change the, the, the practice in your school to, to, to adapt to it? Because your students, they will use these tools. And what are you going to do? 
So for us, that's a big question. We want to, to be ready. So obviously, these tools are completely allowed and encouraged within our education, but I also believe that it should be framed in such a way that we, we train, we coach, we encourage our students to use these tools in, in, in a meaningful and really useful way. And that there is also the question afterwards of how it could impact the job that our students will have in the future. Because as software engineers, if there is a software that can write the code for you, then what are you going to do? And here yeah, I have hopes as well, because I do not believe that uh, software engineers are going to disper disappear as a whole. I believe that the, the job will change in the future. Uh, we'll see what comes. But so far, that's my opinion on that, that the, the current software engineers will be more like problem solvers. Like you have to understand what is the problem at stake be able to express your problem in such a way that is understandable by the, the large language model that will be able eventually to, to generate the code and so on. So I feel that it's a new chapter of education, in particular software engineering education that is opening in front of us and I'm quite excited to be there. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I love that you'd highlight that it's not a question of if it will come or will it come, it is coming, right? That's and you it. can think it's scary or you can think it's exciting because it opens up a lot of doors Sure, what you've understood or how you might do things might change. They will change, actually. But what it can open or, or kind of increase in possibilities is kind of incredible. It is. Like when I played with it, I was like, oh, this is different. Like this yeah. is something that is quite, people always talk about disruptive. No, this is disruptive for sure. It is for sure. It's yeah. changing the way uh, students can learn. It's, uh, it, it's, it's coming. And like it or not like it, it doesn't matter. It is there. Just adapt to it and... And the kids will. Yeah. And one thing that I like is uh, that the educational model at Codam already has like a safety uh, switch <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to, to uh, ChatGPT. Because when you do the the peer-to-peer -peer evaluations, you need to explain every line of code. Yeah. So you could have used ChatGPT to actually copy-paste the code, right? I That's mean, fine. It's possible, yeah. right? But if you didn't understand what you wrote and why you chose this over the other, you will fail. Mm. And the beauty is also, it's not that you put the three people, the three evaluators in one room and you create a presentation. No, no, no. It's one hour with each evaluator. So if one will fail you, I mean, you have to do it again. Yeah. So um, this sort of systems actually help educators to, you know, avoid this sort of uh, problems with ChatGPT, yeah. because our educational model is not based on memory, it's based on understanding. Yeah. And the peer evaluation checks if you understood or you just memorized it from somewhere Stack Overflow, you know? So. Exactly, and then if someone asks you a question, it will not work. No. Because if you don't have the understanding, you won't be able to answer. Exactly, yeah. and also, the, the exams as well, right? So that's those are like exercises or programs that you have to write at the computer. There is no multiple choice, no nothing like that. It's pure coding, right? So these sort of things help to alleviate the the effects of ChatGPT, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's uh, exciting times, <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much for coming on. This thank was a you. lot of fun, actually. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you as well. I'm going to round it off here. Victoria and David and Kodam are going to put all their socials and some extra links in the description below. Check it out. Let them know you came from our show. And with that being said, thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next one.